Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Kopi Epiok and I'm an associate professor at the University of Cape Town. I had the good fortune and pleasure to be involved in a couple of uh, central bank digital currency projects, both from a policymaker perspective as well as from an industry perspective. And my talk today is going to share some of the insights and the discussions and the conflicts um, that we had in these, in these discussions uh, with you and I hope it's going to be useful for the audience. So let me start with arguing why we need a central bank digital currency. And there's a, a very big sort of argument being made within central bank communities that asset tokenization is actually something that we would like um, to encourage because there's new business models, there's new monetization options, um, there is new innovation happening. So just to sort of lay the groundwork and, and make sure we're all on the same page. And the asset tokenization, I understand the process of issuing digital tokens or coins to prove ownership of an underlying asset um, that is represented digitally on a distributed ledger. So this sets it apart already from uh, centralized digital currencies um, that are also springing up left and right in, in central bank communities um, and focus really on those that, that are issued on a distributed ledger. The benefit of asset tokenization is that it can lead to faster settlements. Um, if you look at interbank payments, um, is a very slow uh, process compared to the speed of transactions that you can have in a decentralized system, which has not, which, which is not because of the nature of real-time gross settlement system. They are very fast um, in, in their technology, but the entire ecosystem around the settlement system itself uh, slows the process down and increases the cost. So, by using um, uh, using tokenized assets, we hope that we can enable faster settlements, reduce the transaction cost, and increase transparency. And that increase in transparency is a, is a little bit of a double-edged sword. It's clearly one of the advantages that, that blockchain brings, but as I'm gonna, gonna argue later, it also comes with a couple of, of challenges. Um, think about just interbank markets as an example, when two banks uh, transact with each other regularly and all of a sudden, um, the market always was sort of uh, over the counter and nobody could see exactly who is transacting. Um, now there's a market two banks transact and you would expect based on their past history of transactions that this Monday morning there should be another transaction between the two and this transaction doesn't happen and then the bank that would have received the transaction goes on the interbank market to try to replace the liquidity that it didn't get from the first bank with, with some other liquidity. Now the market knows that this bank has an increased demand for liquidity. So the price um, that, it, that the bank will be quoted um, to obtain interbank borrowing will change. So the transparency that we've created by sort of making the ledger fully visible can translate into price effects on the, on the market, which is highly non-trivial and it's not well understood yet. One of the biggest arguments for um, asset tokenization and moving to distributed ledgers is the cash on ledger problem. So if we have a cash leg in a delivery versus payment transaction of a tokenized asset, so think about a, a digital security of some sorts um, that you want to transact between two counterparties, even if the digital security is on a distributed ledger, and even if that distributed ledger is, um, is very fast, has a high transactions per second, TPS, uh, the settlement for the payment of this security, unless it happens also in some form of, of crypto asset, um, has to be done through the existing payment system, which means it has to be done through the correspondent banking model. It has to be done through a fairly slow process. So this takes away a lot of the advantages of having distributed ledger to settle digital assets and the trade of digital assets. Um, so one of the big arguments for central bank digital currency is to say, well, we want to solve this cash on ledger problem because we recognize that there are new business models around digital assets um, that are actually economically beneficial, um, that can lead to new uses that we, we, we haven't seen before. And this innovation is something that, that is to be encouraged. So we need to solve this cash on ledger problem, or otherwise we will not um, reap the benefits of asset tokenization. So the solution that has, been, that has been put forward is to actually just issue central bank money on a ledger, to have a perfectly stable coin which represents central bank money, which represents 
um, a form of legal tender. Um, and the approach that is taken by sort of different countries uh, usually takes one of, of three forms. So either you, you have already your existing real-time gross settlement system in most countries. Um, some countries, they prefer a fairly centralized approach where you have digital payments, but you don't necessarily have sort of a ledger, like a distributed ledger to, to under, um, uh, as, 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 a, uh, as, a, as a settlement layer underneath it. Um, so you have the centralized camp, but then more and more central banks are exploring both wholesale and retail central bank digital currencies. And I'm gonna talk about both um, a, little bit late, a little bit later. Both differ in sort of scale and scope. And uh, it's not clear yet sort of what the benefits of each are. We are just at the beginning of our understanding of, of what, what we can, uh, how we can benefit from, from these different types of, um, of CBDCs. So one of the one of the big sort of arguments why asset tokenization can be interesting is when you look at existing securities. For example, um, this case could be real estate. You could uh, you could uh, securitize these assets on a distributed ledger, and you can take away some of the lump sum risk that households tend to have in their portfolio. If, if you're a normal household um, that just bought a house, you will have a mortgage on your house and that house as an asset is a huge lump sum risk in your personal portfolio. So ideally you would like to securitize this and sort of sell off smaller parts of your house um, and, and you yourself would like to invest in a more diversified housing portfolio. Real estate investment trusts are existing financial institutions that do exactly that. Um, however, they usually come with high setup costs and especially in an emerging market like in South Africa, um, it's actually a huge problem for large parts of the population to participate in this kind of financial institution. So they are excluded from the market simply because they can't cover the relatively high setup cost. And the hope is that if we use sort of digital assets um, of digital representations of physical assets, we can reduce this, this um, sort of initial cost and make these assets more available to a broader part of the population helping them to achieve financial security. So this has always been in all countries. So this has been one of the big driving force where sort of central bankers understand the benefits of, um, of tokenized assets. Well, then there's sort of the more, a little bit more in the, on, on the fun side of things, but nonetheless, a very important aspect of creating digital collectibles. I just picked CryptoKitties because it was one of the first ones um, and it's fun, but there's something in this digital collectible uh, that I think is a is sort of remnant of a future that is to come. Digital collectibles uh, work because they don't require privacy. So having a set of digital collectibles, in the, in the, in the past it was your baseball or your football cards, uh, today it's your, sort of your, your crypto kitty that, that you have. Um, so of having recorded who owns which digital collectible, which unique digital collectible, um, is not particularly uh, sort of sensitive. So you can have this shared register of who has which digital collectible, and it's for the first time that you have a digital object, digital art, that you make unique by using a blockchain, and by making it unique, by having it registered once and having it owned by one person or a group of person, but by having it once, you can create a price for these digital assets because in a normal system, in a centralized system, the, the, the owner, the operator of the database automatically becomes the owner of the asset because he has the ultimate control of how many copies of that digital object he creates. But if you can create infinitely many, uh, infinitely many digital copies, you can create infinitely um, large supply and that means that the market price for these, for these objects is zero. So as we move into an increasingly digital economy, and the digital economy has outpaced the real economy over the past 10 years at, in, in, in every single year. Um, so as we move into this increasingly digital economy, having a register of digital objects will become increasingly important. Uh, once we figure out the privacy issue, which is not a trivial issue, but once we figure this out, we can do this for all kinds of digital objects and we create digital property rights. And this, I believe, really will be one of the main drivers of where we want to have um, tokenized assets um, 
that, that are being traded using distributed ledgers. So to facilitate this transition into this sort of new digital world, we need a payment system that is up to date and that is sort of um, in sync with the needs of, um, of this digital economy. So now I want to talk a little bit about the different sort of forms of central bank digital currencies that can facilitate this transition into a um, more digital uh, economy going forward. I want to start with the existing real-time gross settlement systems. So first, just to get the nomenclature out of the way. So when I, when I talk about a stable coin, I refer to a cryptocurrency that is designed to minimize fluctuations in value. How that stabilization happens um, is, is, um, is, is up for the design for the cryptocurrency and you, you have various different approaches. So stability can be achieved um, by backing this uh, cryptocurrency with a reserve asset that can be fiat currency, it can be gold, or it can be other crypto assets or through algorithms. Um, there are various approaches to sort of this algorithmic stability. Um, there are various approaches sort of to the, to the crypto asset as a, as a collateral um, for CBDC. Um, and we, when, when we talk about central bank backed digital currencies, we usually talk about fiat currency and gold as a backing for, um, for the CBDC. One of the benefits of using stable coins is their programmability. So we can have stable coins that integrate automatically with smart contracts and other distributed computation mechanisms. That makes them particularly interesting as a new form of financial uh, instrument that completes our um, overall um, space of existing financial instruments um, and can lead to more efficiency um, you can do things with a smart contract that you cannot do with, um, with any other mechanism, in particular when it comes to using smart contracts as a commitment device, as um, a financial contract that cannot be renegotiated because the terms of the contract are set in code, are distributed over a large group of, of nodes, and unless you control a, like the, the majority of nodes, you cannot just rewrite the terms of the contract. In many instances, this has significant advantages and, and is desirable um, for financial contracting. So it's also efficient, so there are low transaction costs, faster settlements. Um, we, can, we can address fungibility when you, when you talk about uh, sort of cash, for example, there is an issue of fungibility because for the lower denomination coins, um, you actually don't usually mint them because it's not worth minting very low value denominated coins. So fungibility becomes an issue, especially if you move into a realm where you have a large number of low value transactions. And if you have digital objects because of the nature of, of digital objects and the, the sort of low cost of copying and creating multiple copies of them, even if you can make them unique, you will end, uh, you, you will end up requiring um, low value transactions to a much bigger extent than what we have today. But also it's about accessibility. And I'm, I'm gonna revisit this point later because it's a key practical uh, consideration of many central banks, um, how um, a CBDC would be accessible. So if we, are, if you, if we design this properly, um, such a stable coin can be, can be used as a means of payment or as a store of value. And if I sort of try to sort of put the different approaches to, um, to CBDCs in, in sort of a, a simple matrix, um, you, you can sort of divide them up in a, in, in, in a scheme like this. So you can first di differentiate between wholesale tokens, those used between financial institutions. Um, think about interbank markets, think about securities payments, so including post-trade. Um, or you can have them as a retail token accessible um, to, to a broad number or a broad um, range of citizens and, and, and users, uh, not only institutions. Um, they can be either backed by central bank issued assets or by privately issued assets. Um, and I'm, I'm going to focus today on, on these three, on, on the utility settlement coin as an example for a wholesale token, um, on Libra as an example for a retail token that is privately issued and on a central bank backed digital currency as an example of a, central, of a retail token backed by central bank issued assets. 
So let me let me show you the the world before um, any sort of RTGS payment. So this is the existing world as we live in today. And the, and the easiest way to think about this is to go back to the good old um, T diagrams and to have a central bank balance sheet and two banks. So this is the simplest possible economy that that you can have, where the two the two banks. Um, both have some reserves, and the central bank has sort of borrowed reserves of an amount um, 100, which the, the bank one borrows from the central bank. Um, bank one then lends 50 euro in this case to bank two. So it's an asset for bank one, a liability for bank two. That liability is backed by assets which are held in the form of um, reserve holdings at the central bank. And so that the first bank's balance sheet balances, it also has to have sort of this reserve holding of 50. And because it borrowed 100 from the central bank, uh, it lends out 50 to the other bank. So you have an interbank loan worth 50 euros um, that is backed by reserves with a central bank. Now, when there is settlement of this interbank loan, all that happens is that the second bank repays the loan to the first bank so that the, the balance sheet position gets reduced by 50 here on the liability side, here on the asset side. And so that the balance sheet still balanced, you have to reduce the asset side of bank two. So you have to transfer 50 reserves from bank two to bank one so that bank one's reserve holdings increase. And all that you, that you see is that there's, an, that there's a swap in the reserves that bank hold with the central bank. This is the existing RTGS system where the central bank sees exactly who pays whom, how much. So after, after the uh, settlement has, has concluded, the new balance sheets have a central bank with 100, um, uh, 100 reserves um, uh, financed through the main refinancing operations, um, borrowed by bank one. There's no more interbank loan. All reserves are held by bank one with a central bank. Everything is, is done easy peasy. So now let's have a look at how a wholesale token would change that. I, I, I use USC just as one example. There are many others out there, uh, some taking a stance on, on, on one over the others. In fact, if anything, I would have various concerns about USC that I wouldn't have with, with other uh, wholesale tokens, but it's a nice example. Um, because USC spent a lot of time thinking about sort of the institutional setup for a wholesale token. So now let me go into, into the world with um, a uh, wholesale CBDC issued by a private participant, in this case, Finality. So the way that the system is supposed to work, um, to the best of my understanding, is that Finality would have a technical account with a central bank. This technical account is sort of separate from the central bank's other accounts. And it's a breach with existing policy where only banks and very few other institutions such as central securities depositories have accounts with a central bank. So usually the central bank only has reserve accounts for banks and very, very few other, um, other institutions. But other than sort of this additional technical account before we have sort of any settlement nothing happens. We have the same picture as before. We have the 100 and open market operations borrowed by bank one, 50 of which are held in deposits at the central bank, 50 remaining are invested as an interbank loan to bank two. Bank two held, holds this in the form of reserves with the central bank. So nothing has changed from the, from the picture before, except that now Finality has its technical account, plus instead of, um, only having accounts with the central banks. Now each bank has an account on the liability side of Finality. Now um, Finality therefore records the coin accounts of both banks and when we have the on-ramping of funds, so funds, uh, when, when banks buy coins from Finality, what they do is they transfer reserves from their reserve accounts to the technical account of Finality at the central bank, which is reflected as an asset for Finality. And Finality in turn credits each bank with a certain amount of tokens, which are one-to-one -to -one backed in this case with the euro. 
So for each bank, you have a swap on the asset side between reserves and coins. And for finality, you just have an increase in the balance sheet. And for the central bank, you have a liability side swap between reserves and the tech account. Nothing else happens. Now, if we have a settlement of claims, the interbank loan that bank one has issued to bank two is being repaid. Now, what this does is it looks a little different from before because the repayment still happens. Bank two reduces its exposure to bank one by 50. So bank one balance sheet is reduced by 50, bank two balance sheet is reduced, reduced by 50. But instead of using their reserves, which they had exchanged for coins before, now they would use sort of the, the coins that they hold with finality. So the settlement of the claim is actually happening on the ledger of finality as opposed to the ledger of the central bank. As you see, the, nothing happens on the central bank ledger. And this is actually one of the, the key concerns that many central banks have, that sort of the settlement of, um, of these transactions happens outside their ledger. In a shared ledger system, you can have the central bank being a node. And in, in all sorts of situations, I know the central bank will insist on being a node on the shared ledger so that they actually have uh, read and write access um, to the ledger. Still, the control over so the settlement of these transactions has been moved from the central bank, from a public entity to a private entity. It's not necessarily good or bad, but it's a change, not just in the technical way the system operates, but it's a fundamental change from something that is, a, that is, that is the purview of a public entity moving into, into a private um, into a private entity. So post the settlement, the central bank, le uh, central bank ledger um, has a 75 technical account. Uh, bank one still has the 25 in, in normal reserves. Finality now has the, the same balance sheet length as before, 75, except that all the coins are held by the first bank. Bank two has a, has a ledger of, of zero. So all this is a reshuffling on coins on, on finality ledger. Now let me contrast this with, um, with Libra and the way that Libra has approached this. So in the Libra setup, you have uh, the non-bank sector with, um, uh, with a balance sheet. You have the banking sector. So here, this includes households and firms. You have Libra and you have a central bank. So to, to have the simplest possible system, we have uh, 10 open market operations borrowed by the banking sector. The banking sector has issued 90 in deposits in this setting. Um, and these deposits are held by the non-bank sector as assets, who also have 10, uh, 10 euro in banknotes, which is a liability of the central bank, and 100 as a loan from the banking sector. So now with Libra being introduced, what would happen is that there's a demand for coins from Libra. So let's say 50, um, 50 Libra coins. Um, these coins must come from somewhere. The only place they can come from in the existing system is if the non-bank sector says, okay, I would like to hold fewer deposits and more coins. So there's a swap from deposits into coins that is reflected on the banking sector balance sheet. In the first step, it doesn't matter. It's just a sort of a different account. It used to be the de deposit account of the non-bank sector. Now it moves into the deposit account of Libra. However, Libra is not necessarily likely to hold these deposits. So the Libra uh, reserve would change these deposits into loans. So it would take some of these deposits and, and buy claims on the, on the non-bank sector. These can be sort of um, government bonds. It can be sort of high quality liquid assets, all kinds of, of good assets that Libra wants to purchase from the banking sector. The big problem is that Libra would gain a lot of bargaining power towards the banking sector um, because they know that they can, at short notice, change the deposits into any kind of claim on the non-bank sector. So they can force the banking sector in, by large liquidity outflows into a fire sale of the bonds that they hold on their balance sheet. And that is a huge risk. So to sort of address this issue, there's a, there's a lot of central banks that explore central bank digital currencies. And we start as before with the exact same balance sheet. Um, we have the notes, and now we want to re we want to sort of have notes uh, and coins that are issued by the central bank. 
So this is assumes that the central bank offers the non-bank sector access to its balance sheet. How much of that access is up for discussion? In the, in the cases that I know best, there was always a discussion around, should we give access to licensed service providers, to non-banks, but regulated, registered entities that would perform payment services? So in this case, what you would do is you can say, okay, these sort of um, coins that, that are on the, on the bank's balance sheet um, are now sort of represent a change from the bank's open, from the central bank's open market operations because the banking sector needs to reduce their deposit holdings. These, the flows that the, that the non-bank sector initiates by changing their demand from deposits to coins has, have to come from somewhere. So what this first does is it increases the central bank balance sheet and now the central bank needs to decide how to, how to create these claims. In the first uh, model, you could create more open market operations to provide liquidity to the banking sector. But if you do that, you require, you acquire additional exposure vis-a-vis -vis banks. The alternative is that instead of doing this through the open market operations, central banks could engage into bond purchasing programs, for example, and then acquire claims on the private sector from the banks, which are initiated by a shift in preferences from deposits to coins. How large this shift is, is not clear. Initially, sort of the fear is that we will see a deleveraging of the, of the banking system and disintermediation. But the equilibrium effect is not clear because it could well be that uh, customers prefer to hold uh, more deposits because they are easily changed into central bank digital currency and this sort of motive to hold cash just doesn't exist anymore in this model. So instead of, sort of having a mixture of cash and deposits, which you always have because cash is cumbersome and difficult to get and expensive, you would probably have more deposits that when there is a crisis, you could initiate a run into, uh, into central bank digital currencies. And just to wrap up in, in, the last, in the last 30 seconds, I want to talk about the four pieces, the four missing building blocks um, for central bank digital currencies. The first is scalability. Uh, just to give you one simple example, if you have a country with 58 million users, your ledger needs to be able to handle around about 4,000 transactions per second. In a peak, you probably have to handle more, and this is if you have sort of 16 hours a day during which transactions happen, around about four transactions per person. It's just how many transactions per second you need to be able to handle. Right now, there are very, very few ledgers who can handle this, but for a retail central bank digital currency, this is the, the scale you need to look at. Um, the second big issue that, says, that has come any time um, we've discussed around CBDCs in a central bank setting is the issue of privacy. Cash guarantees privacy. Um, and it's important that it does because the, there should be limits to how much the government sort of can interfere in the, in the private dealings of its citizens. So what we want is we want to have low value transactions that need to retain privacy and high value transactions that need to be fully auditable. This trade-off in privacy within the same protocol does not exist in any protocol I know. And it's a huge challenge, especially if you combine it with um, the demand for scale. So this is one of the big open problems in, on, on, the, on the protocol level. The third problem is the one of inclusivity. In South Africa, for example, only about 50% of South Africans have a smartphone. How do we include the other half? How do we include users that don't have smartphones? This, this radical inclusivity um, is lacking from most crypto applications out there at the moment. And I've, I've seen way too little research and work being done on this particular issue. If there are good solutions out there, uh, I encourage you to just contact me, come forward. There's huge demand from central banks and specifically this issue of accessibility for in a, in a low file setting. And then the very last point is sort of the interoperability in a future world where we have various central bank digital currencies. How can we ensure um, that uh, tokens in different uh, jurisdictions are interoperable? So there's still, there are some token bridges out there, um, but it's still not fully business ready, I would say. So when we had a look at a different sort of token bridges out there, and I hope I'm sort of not offending anybody in the audience with this, I, I, I think there's still work to be done on the interoperability um, issue, in particular for low value transactions. So these are the big four missing building blocks. If we can work those out, if we can get those right, 
um, I think there's huge um, demand among central bankers to better understand, evaluate, and eventually implement central bank digital currencies. And if we can move to, to this to a point where, where we can have CBDCs and we can make them a reality, um, I think the sky's the limit and um, many new um, business models in the new digital economy will arise. Thank you very much.